Uh, okay, uh, hello and uh, uh, welcome. I'm Bertikt, and I will talk about uh, constraint solvers today. So, what are they? How can we use them to solve uh, puzzles or logic puzzles? And then also a bit on um, how can we apply this to other problems? So, we'll look first at uh, the basics. What are these uh, tools? And what is the specific library we are uh, looking at today? Then we will look at the very classic uh, Sudoku, where probably everyone knows the rules. So this is a, a very good introductory example, so a classic introductory example. And then we will look at two different uh, applications. One is, if you have a software program, how can we find out if something is wrong with this program? And the other application is, you're all using a Linux distribution, I guess, and you, there you have a package manager, or also if you are programming, then you also have a package manager. Like you saw a pip install or nodes install uh, some library. And then you somehow have to install all the dependencies of this library. And every dependency has a version, and the package is require other packages in a certain version. And how do you figure out how to assign and install every package in the right version. This is the uh, last example of today. So then, let me get right into uh, the tour here. Uh, so the program or the library we are using is called uh, C3. This is an open source MIT licensed library that is developed by Microsoft Research and which is a constraint solver or a satisfiability model of theory solver. So we can write down a logic description of uh, the problem we are solving. And we don't have to tell it how to solve it. We just say, OK, for example, what are the, the rules of the, of the game or of the problem we are considering? So. We're going to use Python, so there are bindings for this library in multiple programming languages. I'm going to use Python because it's a very natural syntax, and I think uh, most of you will be familiar with that, or otherwise you're not using, I hope, not too complicated features. So it's, I hope that it will be quite intuitive. So uh, let's start here. Uh, we have this, uh, yeah, we import the library. You can like install it with um, C3 solver. So this would be the name of the of the package. And then let's as a first before we go into the the Sudoku problem, let's solve some elementary school algebra problems. So let's say we have a variable x, and this is an integer. So we tell it here, OK, we have x, which is an integer variable. And we also have to, uh, to give it a name for the solver. In this case, it's the same. It's the, the name x in the solver, as well as the name x in the Python program. Now let's say we write 7 plus x is uh, 10. OK, this doesn't quite work yet. But so we have to say, we have this, we will need a solver as well. So we say, OK, we want to have a solver, which is a solver object. And now we can say, OK, th this solver, we want to add a constraint. So and namely, exactly this one. So 7 plus x should be 10. Um, we want to know if this, if there is an x, which is an integer, such that 7 plus x is 10. OK, and it tells us SAT, which is short for satisfiable. So the problem is satisfied, but this doesn't tell us much yet. So it just said, OK, there is some x uh, such that this very simple equation becomes true. 
maybe we also want to know uh, what that is. So let's say if we have found the solution, then we also want to know what it was. Now it tells us very smartly, like every elementary school kid will also be able to do, that x should be free. And let's do another example. So what happens if you do something that does not work? So we can also say uh, reset. It should forget everything we've told it before. And we want to have, let's say, x divided by 2 should be 13. And remember that we are working with integers. Uh, so solver check. And Wait, what? Oh, right. Um, yeah, this does work, and what I actually wanted to do is this. So I want to have x times 2 equal to 13. And now it tells us, OK, there is no integer uh, that's uh, 13 over 2. So this is the, like, the, the very basics of uh, what we can do. So we have uh, these variables. They can be integers. There are also uh, other data types, like uh, real numbers, even more complex data types, like actual uh, tuples, structures, sets. Uh, but we will focus on these integers uh, for today. So by the way, if you have any uh, question, uh, feel free to interrupt me or to ask whenever, you, whenever the questions occur. So, these are like the, the basics. We have the, we can write uh, small formulas here and then ask the solver, is this true for some value of all the variables in there? And if it is true, then it can also tell us the exact value of these variables. So now let's have a look at the, at the Sudoku. So just as a a reminder, what do we have here? We have this uh, 9 by 9 grid of numbers. Each field needs to be a number between 1 and 9. And for every box here, every number must occur once. For every line, the same. Every number occurs once. And also for every row, every number must occur once. And some numbers have already been filled in. And the typical task is now uh, the human or whoever is uh, doing this puzzle should fill in all the remaining cells. So we could do this by hand, which can be uh, also a quite entertaining uh, problem. Or we write a dedicated program to do this. Or with our constraint solver, we can just tell it what are the Sudoku rules, what are the fields that we have already uh, given in this uh, picture, and then it will automatically uh, solve this Sudoku for us. So again, I'll start with having uh, the import. We also create a solver, and I have a dictionary of cells here. So the first thing we want is we had in this like basic example, we had one variable x. Now we want to have one variable for every cell in our Sudoku. So let's do that. We say, OK, for the, all, the, all the rows in our example, so in range 9, initializing an inner dictionary and 
for every row, we also have, again, nine uh, columns and their So we go through like all the columns and uh, rows and create one integer variable for all of them. And we store this in a two-dimensional uh, dictionary. See if this works. Um, do I still have, oh. Yeah, I don't want any print code yet, so should do nothing. Okay, then what was the next uh, role we had for our Sudoku? We said all these cells need to be numbers between one and nine. So let's write this down as well. So we have again these two uh, for loops and then we say, okay, solver add, we want this cell Greater or equal to one, and less than or equal to nine. Okay, what is the next thing we have to do? We want all the rows to be distinct. So we're going here, all the rows, and and then there are uh, some handy uh, features in this solver. So this uh, C3 has a function that is called distinct. So here we can uh, give it a variable argument list uh, of, var of uh, C3 variables, and then it automatically creates a constraint that none of these should have the same value. So we want that this that the cells in I, and this is now a dictionary, so everything that is in there, so this should be distinct. And oh, sorry. Uh, so what I just did, so uh, Python has a nice feature that can turn a list or a, a, any iterator into an argument list. So distinct takes a variable argument list, as you can see here, but values gives me an iterator. So with this dereferencing operator, I can convert this. So now we have the, the constraint. Okay, we have, we have our variables. We have the, they're in the correct range. The rows are distinct. Now we have to go on to the columns. They might be a little bit more tricky, but let's see. So there were again nine uh, columns. And Okay, what, what are the variables of uh, one column? Um, let's, this would be the cell of i and j, and here again, I can range over nine. Or i in range nine. So we, for every uh, column in our uh, Sudoku, uh, we again iterate over all the row indices and uh, collect this into one list. 
So we now have a list of all the, the variables in one row. We again put a constraint there, they should be distinct. And now we get back to, if you look, look so we have this constraint and this constraint, uh, but we have these boxes here as well. So this is maybe um, so we want to iterate over these boxes. So we start at one to nine in step wait three. So this would now iterate over the top left cell of every, of every box. So this one, this one, this one, and so on. Now for every one of these, we want to collect all the elements here. So this would be, this is like cell of A plus. Okay, so for every of the, these top left cells, we want to move three to the left and three down and collect all the, the combinations of this. And we can write this as a neat little um, list comprehension in Python. And now we can again say, so all of these boxes should be distinct. And somehow I did something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, right, if you start the range at zero, go up to nine and do this in steps of three, then we'll get zero, three, and six. Yeah, now it's going to work. And then we have to, this picture here, uh, which I took from this uh, website, which is called uh, Cracking the Cryptic, which is a Sudoku YouTube channel or so. So uh, they have this uh, as one of their examples. And we can now so I've already pre-written all these like constraints here. I'm just going to copy them over. Because I don't think you want to see me typing in all of that. So this is just telling it, okay, there it is. This is the cell zero, zero, which is this one, and this is a six. Then the cell zero, two, which is this one would be a nine. And going through all the, the known numbers and telling it, okay, these are the numbers we already know. Hmm. Now we can just say, okay, solver, check if this is possible, if it's possible to solve this Sudoku. If it is, then please tell us what it is and show us a semi nice grid of of the solution. And it worked. We have like this six and the nine here, and all the other numbers are also filled in. And if you look here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, no duplicates. Same here. And if you look at this box, then it also looks fine. 
So, surprise, our solver was able to solve a Sudoku. And we did this in 15 minutes or so with all the explanations as well. And the uh, solving time itself is uh, instant. Uh, maybe we want also to do, uh, look into a more complicated Sudoku. So there are very strange modifications of Sudoku that some people like to do. Like this one from the same uh, website by, contributed by someone called Kodak. And we only have six numbers filled in here. And we have these purple and these gray lines. And how are they, uh, how are they supposed to solve a, a Sudoku with so few clues? So the thing is, all, all the cells that are on one of these purple lines should be consecutive numbers. But they can be in any order. So, and also starting at any uh, point. So this might be 2, 4, 3, 2. Or five, seven, six, eight, something like that. And these uh, gray lines are supposed to be palindromes. So in this case, it's simple. So this just means that these two uh, cells should have the same value. If this line would be longer, uh, then like the, the start and the end point should be the same value. One uh, step inwards should also be the same value, and so on. So how difficult do you think would it be to adapt our code to solve this new puzzle? If any idea what's, what we should add here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I just have copied over the, so we can keep all the standard Sudoku rules, but we want something else as well. So yeah, so what we need is something uh, consecutive permutation. So we want to give it a list of cells and say this should be these con one of these consecutive permutations. So first, to, do we write, we're going to write a constraint or a function that generates as a constraint for elements being con consecutive. So let's say we have the, we're assuming this is a list which has at least one element. And so this would be the first element. And then we can say, okay, X should be one of the other elements. Uh, no, it should be this element. Shift. So if this is the zero of elements, then we want to say, okay, this, the, the element with the index one should be x plus one. So this way. And the element with the index 2 should be x plus 2. Uh, so this for i should be then in range of the length of the elements. And, but starting at 1, yes. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if you add this um, one here, otherwise we would get a constraint that tells us uh, the zero of element is the same as the zero of element plus zero. Yeah, that's obviously true as well. Now we want to say, okay, all of these should hold, so there is something. We return the end of all of these constraints. Okay, now we need all the permutations of that. 
and we're lucky and Python has the, in the standard library something called iter tools. So this thing has something called permutations. So this can just give us all the permutations of a list. So this gives us a list with lists in all possible orders of the same elements. And for each one of these, we say Okay, and this time we don't want all of the uh, permutations to be uh, consecutive, or this wouldn't make sense, but we want that one of the permutations is consecutive. So this satisfies this, they should be in any order. So there is some way we can switch them uh, such that they are in ascending order without gaps, like, uh, yeah, consecutive. Now we just, we have all the, the things we need, we can just add again the, the constraints. So we know that there were six numbers uh, known already. Like we have the, the known numbers and we have these two uh, gray lines here and here. And then we have lots of these rows here. And I must say, I was really surprised that this is such a hard puzzle because it's, uh, I tried it uh, before and it took almost a minute to do so. Let's see how slow it is this time. So this is a, a quite a challenging thing, not only for, for humans, but unfortunately also for the computer. Maybe there is a way how we could uh, further optimize this, but at least the, the time of writing down the rules was <laughs> quite fast. But the, the humans doing this, um, I think the, the video is about 35, 40 minutes long. So, and still faster than a professional human Sudoku solver. So while that thing is working, we can look at another problem. So I promised you something about uh, verifying source code. So I'm not going to dig into this whole uh, field here, but a very uh, simple example without too much control structures. There is something called a sorting network. So you have a fixed number of variables that are uh, given in some order, and then you want to sort them via some uh, pipeline. So what can, what are, there is one operation that you can do there. This is called a compare and swap. So you look at two uh, numbers in this uh, network, or, and you compare them. So if the first number is uh, less than the second number, then you swap them, otherwise you keep them the same. And then if you specify an order of these uh, compare and swap operations, then I'm claiming that this will sort any five numbers with just these nine instructions. 
if you just look at these, like you say, okay, zero and one, then two and three, zero and two, one and three, here zero and four. If you just look at this, would you believe me that this is really sorting something? Or am I just writing down any weird sequence of cells? <laughs> or how about this one? It looks slightly different. And as I'm claiming that one of these actually sorts the numbers and the other one does not. But you could execute it and maybe you're also lucky and find an example where you can distinguish those where one sorts correctly and the other one doesn't. But we can also use our SMT solver or a constraint solver to check that. But let's first go back to our super Sudoku and okay, it took two minutes. So that was quite slow, but it finally managed to uh, find a solution for for this puzzle as well. So let's get back to this like sorting networks. So we have these one, these two networks here. So how do we write a Boolean constraints that are true or false depending on if this operation worked or not? So the first idea here is that we define these five variables, not just once, but for every uh, state of the program. So how does they look before we do the first uh, compare and swap? What are the values after the first one? What are they after the second, the third, and the ninth one? And then we want to check, is there some inputs, like some values for the uh, first five numbers, such that the last uh, numbers are not sorted. So let's just open that. So what, what did I do here? So I have, as I said, I have these variables. So we have n equals five variables, and both of these uh, programs had 10 steps. So we are having like x 0 to 4 and step 0 to 9. And then if you look here at this uh, C program, we had this if uh, statement here. Let's uh, look at A and B, or it's, uh, this macro here. Look at A and B, if A is less than B, then uh, swap them, otherwise do nothing. So how does this look as a, as a constraint in C3? We go over all the, oh, so we, we define this like compare and swap function here. This has like four parameters. One is a list of old variables. Like these are the variables of the, of the previous step. Then we have new, which are the variables after we have done this compare and swap. And then there is two indices of the two elements we are considering for this operation. Then obvious, or we, we are going to say for all the variables, if they are not uh, of the pair that we are considering for swapping, then it's definitely unchanged. So the variable in the next step has exactly the same value as the old one. On the other hand, if they are considered for swapping, then we create an if then else constraint. So this says if the same constraint as we had in the C program, then the new variable for the index one and two are exactly the opposite of the old variable, so they are swapped. If, this is, if they are already in the right order, then again, we do nothing. And this is like the, this is a constraint that encodes this compare and swap macro from our C program. 
Now we just have to take the, these instructions here and also write them down as a constraint. Like this already has this solver add, so we don't we just have to say okay, compare and swap with the appropriate indices. And the, these old and new variables, they are just threaded through. So this is the old variables is zero, the new variables is one. And for the next operation, the old variables is the result of the previous operation, and then again until we are at down at the end of the pipeline at uh, stage nine. Now we might uh, write something like this. We say, okay, all these asserts that we had here should be true. But what does this really check? So remember, we had a satisfiability solver. So we said there are variables and we want to know, is there one assignment for every variable so that all these constraints are true? So would this be a correct solution? Yeah, I, I saw someone shaking their head. So this wouldn't work. This would just say, okay, there is at least one sequence of numbers that is sorted correctly by our network. This isn't really what we're interested in. Instead, we want to have this. So we want to say, okay, is there something, some input such that the last numbers are not sorted? So any of the of two consecutive elements are in the wrong order. So this would give us, there is no solution to this problem if our program is correct, and it finds a solution, namely the input sequence that violates our assumptions or our assertions as if, there, if the program is incorrect. So if you try that, and I've also, encoded the second network as well with like just the different uh, swap operations. Now we can execute this and it tells us unsatisfiable for the first one. So the first one is correct and the second one is satisfiable. So there is a sequence where it is not sorting correctly and this sequence it was also a, uh, telling us this. So if you have two, zero, zero, one, and three, it's like one example, then this isn't sorting. Like this, the, the end result, which I also uh, included here, says, okay, this is two, three, one, zero, zero. And this is obviously not sorted correctly. So it's just two, three, one. That's, that's not working. And there is a, a whole research area also on how to generalize this to, to larger programs. So what if you have more complex control structures? What it is if you have loops and so on? And obviously we don't want to write this, we don't want this translation from C to, to Python uh, done by hand, but there are programs that can do this and that can then analyze your source code and try to find violations of assertions, for example. And the last example that I promised you will be about package managers. So as we said, every one of you probably you installed a package at some point. Um, so what, what is our assumption for our package manager? Uh, we say, okay, a package has a name and this name is uh, unique and every package also has uh, different versions it's available in. And then again, a package has dependency or can have dependencies. So to install package A, we might also need to install package uh, B and C. And all these packages again come in different versions. So, and we should not specify, so normally these package managers don't say, okay, I need this package in exactly this version, but they tell us uh, a range of versions that is acceptable 
for this version of the package. So I have a very tiny example here. But I'm going to like uh, draw this uh, dependency graph here. So let's say we have our package A, which depends on the packages B and C. And these in turn both depend on the package D. So we have this diamond-shaped uh, dependency. And then, yeah, maybe not. The package A has the, version, the possible versions 1 or 2. For B, it is like 2 and 4. So. Yeah, so these are just the, the available versions of every package. And then I'm not going to write down all these like, other constraints, but uh, like, the idea maybe here is, so package A requires both B and C. But with the update of version 2, we are going to use some new feature of our library C, which is only available in version 6 and newer. Then and package B also updated its dependency on D at some point between version 2 and 4. And for C, it's also like there is a version 1 that uses the old version of D, and 6 uses the old one, and 7 uses the newest uh, version of the library D. And D itself doesn't have any dependencies. So we already know that we want to install all four of these packages. So for this small example, we're not trying to figure out which packages to install, but just which version of the packages. So is there some uh, way to assign version numbers to each of these packages such that all these constraints are satisfied? And this is, let's see what to do here. So we have, yeah, we have these packages, and we say, OK, every package gets an integer variable that says, this is the version of this package you should install. And as I've drawn here on the blackboard, not all uh, versions of the package are still available. Maybe some are deprecated or no longer in the package repository we have there. So we also add constraints of for, for every package, what are the versions uh, we might install. And if we encounter like this version ranges that we have here, then we say, OK, if we have a package in this range, then it should be greater or equal than the minimum version, and it should be less than the maximum, uh, or the, the first version that would no longer be supported. And now for every package in our uh, database, we can say, OK, for all the dependencies, So, or like for every, every version has a dependency list. And for this dependency list, uh, we say that uh, all of the, the uh, package of the dependencies must be in the bounds. And then we say, OK, if our package, whatever, is in this version, then it must satisfy all the bounds for this version. And we do this for every package, and it tells us that we get two, four, six, and version two for package D. And our solver has figured out how to properly install all the libraries in a way that everything works happily together. Okay. Thank you.
Do we still have time for questions or? Okay, so we have uh, one minute for questions. Yes, please. What if there is more than one possible solution? Uh, so the question was, what happens if there is more than one uh, solution that satisfies all our constraints? So the solver will find you one of them. And there is something, I think you can say solver dot. Mm. I think there is a function that can uh, iterate all the solutions. And I think it does this in a relatively naive way. So it adds, an, once it found one uh, solution, then you can add a new constraint that says, okay, give me a solution that is not this one. And then you search again. I'm not sure, maybe there is, they implemented something more smarter, but this would be the, the like naive way how you can find all the solutions. When, when you found one, you add a constraint, okay, is there another one? Is there a solution that satisfies this and is not one of the solutions I've already seen? Any other questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so the question was, uh, does it op uh, support optimization? Can I ask it for finding the maximum or maybe the minimum value of a, of a variable? Uh, yes, there is uh, an extension that is then called uh, maxset. Uh, there you can then say, okay, I want uh, a certain variable to be uh, maximized or minimized. So the, the performance of the pure Boolean satisfiability solver is uh, better, but there is, uh, so C3 has support for this optimization as well. Uh, any other questions? And I've, I, I think I, we're, we are out of time, so. Thanks for your attention and for your questions, and have a nice day.